Hey, how's it going everybody? Welcome back. So today we have a new video. Uh, this is actually a full documentary. It's six, it's almost 60 minutes, a whole hour. So this did take me quite a few days just to make. So um, I'm going to get straight to it. I'm not going to show the steps that I took to create it. It's just, uh, you know, straight away, ready to go, ready to watch. So I'll just kind of break down what I did to it just in the meantime. Um, so I did denoise this using AI also upscale to um, a higher resolution not 4k about half of that and then also i did colorize this whole entire documentary using the oldify so um you know with the colorization it's not going to look exactly how it did back then it's all you know guessing it's all up to the ai so you can't really change anything unless you go in later and do some color correcting but yeah, I'm going to shut up here and you can enjoy the rest of this documentary. Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. <laughs> embargo is far too great a security to American peace to permit its surrender without a last ditch fight. You people who oppose war and dictatorship do not be dismayed because the warmongers and the interventionists control most of the avenues of propaganda. At this critical moment in the world's history, when the democracies of Europe are facing the test of life or death, all Americans are of one mind. We want to assist the democracies in every way we can with materials and supplies. England is the last and only barrier between the United States and total war. Our aid must not come too late. Therefore, we must give President Roosevelt power to set in motion an industrial blitzkrieg that will make it possible for England to blast Hitlerism from the face of the earth. It was fully and freely debated. Men were stamped interventionists and isolationists. 
and the debate grew bitter. Earnest young men picketed the White House as if peace were in our hands and not in the hands of those who wanted no peace, who worshipped war. Other earnest young men picketed the pickets. Curious organizations mushroomed into being with stunts such as these. Into this free debate trooped the agents of the aggressors, for they too were permitted to speak in our democracy. They wore Hitler's uniforms, but they wrapped themselves in the American flag. They preached the doctrine of racial and class hatred, for Hitler had said America could be conquered from within and fall as an overripe plum to the Nazi master race. Jewish Moscow directed domination. We let them speak. When occasionally a lone, outraged dissenter wanted to air his opposition, we provided police to preserve order. This was Madison Square Garden in New York City, and not Berlin, nor Nuremberg. Later, this speaker was arrested. It was because he had filched money from his deluded followers, and he was sent to Sing Sing to brood upon the strange ways of democracy. Another debate was in progress. Labor and management resorted to strikes and lockouts to settle differences, which at times surged into violence. True, we had taken giant steps along the road of conciliation, but scenes such as these convinced the Axis they had nothing to fear from America. They knew our industrial capacity was great. We could never use it to the full, they said. Our plants were there, but they were made idle. America was at war. It had been at war, although few Americans realized it, for more than 10 years. Ever since September 18, 1931, when Japan clawed Manchuria out of the body of China. While Hitler was still brawling in the streets of Munich, Japan had already begun weaving the pattern of aggression. It started with an incident. A Japanese train on the South Manchurian Railway had been dynamited. Promptly, Japanese battalions invaded Mukden. This was not mechanized warfare. By later standards, this war was primitive, small. Trivial, the Japanese cabinet officially labeled it when China protested to the League of Nations. Twelve Japanese planes bombed a Chinese city. Trivial. The League demanded Japan withdraw her troops. Japan's own vote was the sole dissenting one. Therefore, said Japan, the League's action was illegal. It wasn't unanimous. Secretary of State Stimson was concerned. We had signed the Pact of Paris, which guaranteed China's territorial integrity. We sent an observer to the League. Japan protested, finally consented. The League investigated. Under Admiral Nomura, Japanese forces attacked 15 miles from Shanghai. The same Nomura, who later as Japanese ambassador, talked peace in Washington while his colleagues in Tokyo prepared for war. Japan marched into Shanghai with troops, fifth columnists, quislings, and propaganda actually anticipating methods used in the conquest of Europe. Japan marched out of Shanghai at the insistence of the League. She signed a truce with China on May 4, 1932. Four months later, Japan moved further into Mongolia, sent her colonizers to follow the army into the conquered territory. And the puppet state of Manchukuo was in full flower. The League branded Japan an aggressor, and Japan resigned, deeply hurt. Japan moved further into China. Pausing only for breath, Japan inflated the Mukden incident into the China incident. It was not war, the Japanese said. 
400 million Chinese were caught up in this incident. China was looted and shelled and put to the torch. China was bombed in this incident. Chinese forces united under Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek were pressed back by the invaders. China moved her armies and her meager war industries far into the interior. The Chinese fought on not so much with weapons as with space and time. Few Americans knew Japan. To us it was a land of Fujiyama, of cherry trees exquisite gardens, geisha girls, picturesque peasants. We had opened Japan to the Western world. They had bought our machines, copied our architecture, our clothes, our popular music, and had even adopted our games. Although they marched to the baseball diamond as men marching to war, And they said they played ball to build their bodies for war. Americans knew little of the might of Japan. Japan, we thought, was only an imitator. True, they had a navy, makeshift, we said. And the Japanese carefully fostered the legend their men couldn't fly their imitation planes. And yet, imitation or not, the weapons of war were there. And the warriors of Japan, still breathing the spirit of the samurai in an era of machines, adopted Western methods of warfare as they had adopted Western clothes and architecture and music. And the Japanese warriors dreamt of the conquest of Asia and then of the world and their emperor invoked the blessings of the divine upon this dream. Italy too had dreams of empire. So Italy too created an incident in Ethiopia. Having achieved unity within by virtue of the club, castor oil, and the concentration camp, Mussolini was ready. Italy at the time had the foremost air force in Europe. Emperor Haile Selassie rallied his tribesmen, armed only with spears and ancient rifles, to oppose tanks, guns, trained armies, and planes. The slaughter continued for a little less than two years. The emperor appeared before the League and pleaded the protection of the great powers. The League applied sanctions which were not completely enforced. Two years after it had begun, the war was over. Italy had joined Japan in the partnership of aggression. A 
On March 13, 1938, Hitler marched into Austria. The trinity of aggression was complete. Four years Hitler had planned and plotted. His Austrian Nazis had assassinated Chancellor Dolphus for refusing to play the role of puppet. In defiance of the Versailles Treaty, Germany had established compulsory military service, brought its secret army into the open, had begun converting its huge industrial plant for war, had reoccupied the demilitarized Rhineland zone. Germany had practically wiped out the defeat of 1918. So Hitler marched into Austria. His conquest was bloodless. It was not entirely bloodless. German and Italian forces had been fighting in Spain. General Franco had revolted against the Republican government. He invited and received German and Italian aid. The duly elected government received some Russian aid. The democracies evolved a formula of non-intervention. The data's brush side. Here was opportunity for a dress rehearsal for full-scale war. An excellent chance to test new weapons and tactics. The Spaniards were the guinea pigs. Men, women and children. It was a long war, ended finally by hunger. Hitler was not content with Austria. At Munich, he had said his theory of race and blood demanded the incorporation of all German-speaking peoples into the Reich. There were those in England, France, and the United States who did not think this an unreasonable demand. Hitler called upon Czechoslovakia to surrender the Sudetenland, that part of Czechoslovakia heavily populated by Germans. France was bound by treaty to the republic created under the old Austrian Empire. France and Soviet Russia were linked in a defensive pact. Great Britain's destiny was linked with that of France. So Hitler, Prime Minister Chamberlain of Great Britain, Mussolini, Premier Daladier of France, met in Munich, and because the democracies of Europe were hungry for peace, removed a thorn from Hitler's side, the Czech army and the little Maginot line. Europe breathed a sigh of relief. Mussolini's people were jubilant. They wanted peace. Hitler rolled into the Sudetenland. His people were jubilant. Here was the miracle man, they said. A man who conquered with words. This was a new kind of war. A delightful war. Bands and flowers and parades. A smiling war. A lovely war. Not a shot fired. Not a man hurt, nor a woman, nor a child. War was a holiday. Hitler told his people he was content. He wanted no more territory. He guaranteed the integrity of the mutilated Czechoslovak Republic. Thereupon he paused to rest, and then marched into Prague. The Republic was destroyed. The democracies had lost a valuable ally. Italy's reward was Albania, again bloodless. Slight resistance. Now Europe realized the hunger of the aggressors could not be appeased. On April 14, 1939, President Roosevelt appealed to Hitler and Mussolini for a ten-year guarantee of peace, and Hitler mocked, as he called the role of his future victims. Litauen, Estland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Niederlande, Belgium, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, die Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxemburg, Polen, Ungarn, Rumänien, Yugoslavien. The Reichstag roared. Hitler had signed a treaty of friendship with Poland. 
He had given Poland a slice of Czech territory, and now it was Poland's turn to ascend the sacrificial altar. The democracies had pledged themselves to come to the aid of Poland, and then Hitler executed what seemed at the time a master political stroke. Having come to power as the savior of Germany from communism, having gained support in certain circles of the democracies as the slayer of the Red Dragon, having built his entire system of alliances upon a worldwide anti-communist crusade, Hitler sent his foreign minister von Ribbentrop to Moscow. Maxim Litvinov's policy of collective security had been scrapped at Munich. Now Russia and Germany signed a treaty of friendship. Hitler's propaganda machine hummed, for even in a dictatorship, masses of men and women must be prepared for war. But Poland stood firm. Great Britain stood firm. Hitler didn't declare war. On September 1st, 1939, he struck without warning which is the way of the aggressor. You will soon see Hitler's own photographic record of the Blitz in Poland. The formula is simple enough. First, choose your victim, an army still living in the past. Few planes, fewer tanks, outmoded guns and outmoded tactics. Choose an army relying upon courage rather than And on the ground, let the master race assemble the first of its slave populations, a stunned and shocked and hungry people whose sufferings do not end with the armistice, nor their resistance. Now, gloat. The winter of 1939 and 40 was described by amateur statesmen and strategists as the period of the phony war. True ships were sunk in the Battle of the Atlantic, and men died in this phony war, but there were no land battles. France was waiting behind its Maginot Line that vast underground fortress deemed impregnable by its military experts. Allied strategy relied upon starving the Reich into submission. Hitler's armies would collapse for lack of fuel and food and raw materials. Spring shattered this comfortable illusion. Norway and Denmark had staked their survival upon the strictest interpretation of neutrality to escape the war. Their sympathies were with the Allies, but they took extraordinary precautions to avoid offending Hitler. So, on April 9th, Hitler invaded Mark and Norway. Denmark was powerless to resist, and didn't. Norway was stunned by an avalanche of force and treachery. Invaders were hidden in merchant ships in Norwegian harbors. Fifth columnists, led by Major Quisling, a Norwegian traitor, spread panic and confusion. On May 9th, Hitler invaded Holland and Belgium. These nations too hoped to avert war. And these nations too minded their own business and spoke softly. But Hitler struck at them, again without warning, because he had decided the Battle of France could best be won by outflanking the Maginot Line. 
He had no quarrel with these nations. They were merely convenient roads to France. Simultaneously, the Nazis smashed across Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. This pictorial record you are watching was made by Nazi cameramen at the order of Dr. Goebbels, the German propaganda minister. He showed this Wagnerian symphony of devastation to neutral nations in Europe and South America to frighten them into surrender. You will observe that here in Holland, for example, not one German soldier is killed or wounded or even suffers a fractured ankle in an avalanche of destruction. For Dr. Goebbels is a showman, and what he is ballyhooing is the mystical invincibility of the Nazis, or at least that was his theme song until Britain refused to surrender to Air Marshal Goering's armada and until the Russians slaughtered well over a million of invincibles. To the now familiar recipe of the Blitz were added parachute troops who swarmed down upon Dutch cities and airfields and further disrupted a hopeless defense. Men had discussed and most armies had experimented with this new dimension in mobile warfare, but the Nazis were the first to use parachutists in force. Guns and ammunition sailed down in special parachutes and were assembled quickly on the ground. Thus, the Nazis could capture and destroy airfields, railroad stations, and other strategic points back of the defenders' lines. Using tanks, dive bombers, big guns, The Nazi machine broke the back of Dutch resistance in four days. Towns and villages were in flames as the invaders rolled on at a breathless pace, encircling the defenders and slashing their armies, destroying in the name of the new order the homes and shops of those who had dared to resist. Bewildered refugees clogged the roads, seeking escape where there was no escape. This was Rotterdam, bombed after the Dutch forces had surrendered. The Nazis said there had been a mistake. The news had not reached the Luftwaffe in time. When the Nazis entered this once prosperous city, the night skies were red with fire. And the next morning, reconnaissance planes flew over the city as they had flown over Warsaw, recording for the propaganda ministry another tribute to the efficacy of the Luftwaffe, while Rotterdam buried its dead, as Warsaw had, and formal negotiations for surrender were duly completed. It took 18 days more to engulf the Belgians and drive the Anglo-French army into the sea. 
the french and british armies had moved to the aid of the belgians but wars are not won by improvisations and in their desire for neutrality the belgian and dutch governments had failed to perfect joint defense with the allies before the nazis struck the invaders rolled on This was the Belgian cathedral city of Louvain, scarred in the First World War and restored anew, and again it fell victim to the invaders. Again its inhabitants took to the roads to escape the pursuing fires. cathedral crashed in flames. The invaders rolled on. Morning found the refugees still fleeing blindly. Reputable observers said these refugees were machine gunned from the air. There is no photographic evidence of this. And this is what they fled. The Nazi machine moved on and after a day's destruction, paused only to sleep. This was Antwerp where the democracies had fired oil tanks as their armies retreated. Brussels was spared, for it had been declared an open city, and the Nazis marched in, meeting no resistance. Belgium was doomed, and King Leopold capitulated. The improvised Allied defense collapsed. The British Army was driven into the sea at Dunkirk, according to plan. Dunkirk has been called the triumph of man over the machine.
challenge the dive bombers, Spitfires rose from British bases and fought for the domination of the air over the desolate beach, while ground forces continued a stubborn rear guard action. British ships, cruisers, destroyers, yachts, paddle boats, anything that could float, crossed the channel and evacuated some 350,000 British and French troops back to England. For the British were determined to save their men. Here in the wreckage was the story of the epic evacuation. Men walked into the sea and swam to their rescuers. They couldn't take their weapons, trucks, tanks or guns, but men were saved to fight again. Slashed through Luxembourg, Belgium and Holland, five German armies fanned out across France. Treachery and incompetence had doomed the nation that only a decade ago had been leader of Europe. Now the campaign mounted in fury as France crumbled. This was Rouen. Paris had been evacuating its children. There was talk of defending the city street by street. This plan was abandoned. From the beginning, the French, like the British, tried to spare children the sight and sound of war, but the parting was hard.
On June 10th, four days before France fell, Mussolini entered the war. He had waited until that moment to make his decision. And now the Nazis entered Paris. This had been the dream of the Kaiser in the last war. Hitler achieved it. And the Maginot Line was still there. The Nazis had merely outflanked it. Now they tried direct attack, and the Maginot Line fell. The First World War had ended officially in this railroad car, where Marshal Foch had received the delegates of the vanquished Germans. Hitler commandeered the car for what he believed was the end of the Second World War. The French army was no more. Hitler was master of Europe. England would surrender, for although it had rescued its men from Dunkirk, it had not rescued their equipment. The Nazi soldiers were singing, we're sailing against England. Here at Compiègne, Vichy was born. Hitler was happy. Britain alone remained as Hitler's sole barrier to a total victory. Nazi submarines, now berthed on the conquered coast, set out to starve the British people into submission. Nazi planes, now only a few minutes' flight from the English coast, set out to bomb the British people into submission. Nazi propagandists, making full use of the new weapon, the radio, set out to talk the British people into submission. The voice you hear is that of Lord Haw Haw. The Blitzkrieg? will be carried over the British Islands with greater, more appalling rapidity than over Poland, Norway, Holland, Belgium, or France. Prime Minister Churchill rallied his people in what he called their finest hour. He had offered them nothing but blood and sweat, toil and tears. They accepted his gift. Britain was fighting in the Seven Seas, while the invader was only 20 miles away and the French fleet was no longer its ally. Nazi submarines, mines, planes and surface raiders constituted a formidable menace to Britain's lifeline, the freighters that brought her food and raw materials for war. Britain hung on. Now the Nazi Air Force, Hitler's ace weapon, was brought into play. German bombers attacked English ports, so that even if the freighters escaped submarines and mines, they faced destruction in harbors, and the lifeline could be cut at its source. They bombed railroads and factories to disrupt transportation and war production. They bombed by day, and when the Royal Air Force smashed more than 180 of the bombers out of the sky in one session, they bombed by night. The face of London changed. Historic landmarks disappeared. Night after night, London was left a sea of fire.
Plymouth was battered. Coventry. Air armadas appeared over these cities through the fall and winter of 1940 and well into the spring of 1941. Wreckage was cleared and production continued. A new army was created, equipped with new weapons. In the Mediterranean, the British sought out the Italian fleet, which refused to leave its harbors. Finally, the British had to bomb landlocked Italian warships. Malta, British stronghold, survived ceaseless pounding by Nazi and fascist air. The British sweep through Libya by General Sir Archibald Wavell succeeded in destroying Mussolini's empire. The British captured Eritrea and Somaliland, and in May 1941, Haile Selassie was restored to his throne. Under Marshal Rommel, Nazi forces slashed into Egypt. But whatever the immediate future might hold for the democracies in the Middle East, the Italian fascists had lost the war in Africa as well as in Europe. Here are Italian prisoners captured in the first Libyan sweep. As they were led off to prison camps, the name of Mussolini seemed to have lost its luster, and before long he was to find himself competing with Vichy for the favor of Hitler. Britain still stood, and Hitler frustrated turned east. If this were to be a long war, he would need Russian oil and Russian wheat. So he proclaimed himself anew the archenemy of communism, despite his earlier plea to the German people that National Socialism and Communism could live side by side. Now he told them he didn't mean what he said before, but he did mean what he said before that. Military spokesmen in Berlin said the Red Armies would be encircled and destroyed within six weeks. Its remnants would retreat back of the Urals. There the Japanese could deal with them at the proper time. Joseph Stalin rallied the Russian people. Soldiers and civilians responding with a unanimity that amazed a world that had heard much and knew little of them, rose to repel and harry the invaders. Working with whatever tools they could seize, working against time, men and women, old and young, carved these huge tank traps. Weapons were distributed to civilian guerrillas assigned to operate back of enemy lines. Anti-aircraft guns swung into place to battle Luftwaffe advance units. Here was the wheat that Hitler wanted. And Russian men, women and children were determined to keep it out of his hands. This time there would be no easy loot. Machines as well as men helped harvest this most precious of war materials. And their prize cattle were driven east. And when the tempo of invasion mounted, the Russians did not hesitate to burn their crops and their homes and their barns, so that the conquerors would find ashes as their prize. They would have neither food nor shelter. Factories worked day and night, for the Russians knew this was a war of machines. Entire plants moved east, complete with workers. Weapons of war poured out of these factories, 
and the Germans, as well as the rest of the world, discovered the Russians had tanks to meet tanks and planes to meet planes. The Russians retreated, but not without inflicting sizable casualties. German prisoners captured seemed shocked at the ruthless opposition they encountered. It had been different in France. Winter found the Russian army still intact. German casualties mounted until they were counted in the millions. Hitler's armies were not smashed in the winter campaign, but the Russians the initiative and held it. As the snows melted, Hitler was to meet new Russian armies and new machines as summer came to the 2,000 mile front. We were not sufficiently on the alert in Hawaii. The Japanese won a series of spectacular victories in the Pacific. Under General Douglas MacArthur, American and Filipino forces fought a fabulous delaying action in the Philippines. Manila was bombed, although it was declared an open city. Because of vast distances, it was impossible to send supplies or reinforcements, and Bataan fell only when Americans and Filipinos had eaten their mules. General MacArthur established his headquarters in Australia and as Commander-in-Chief of the United Nations forces in that area, prepared for the offensive that would develop inevitably. For despite setbacks, we had established a supply chain 6,000 miles across the Pacific that stretched to New Zealand. Like the other democracies, we were not prepared for total war. Fortunately, under the Lend-Lease Act of March 1941, we had set out to become the arsenal of the free and fighting nations. We were determined to supply them with our war goods, whether they could afford to pay or not. We were buying time. Time to convert the industries of peace into war. Time to make ships, merchant ships and war ships. Time to make planes and more planes, bombers and fighters, faster, more powerful than any the world had ever seen. Time to make guns, and more guns, shells, and more shells, tanks, and more tanks. Time to gather the huge strength which was ours, to pour the great riches of American Earth into the cauldron of war. Iron, steel, oil, coal. Time to build a navy called upon to fight in both oceans and upon all the seas, to convoy men and weapons to Australia, to Britain, to the Middle East, to Russia. A navy that had already undertaken daring raids upon the Gilbert and Marshall Islands and brave Japanese waters and had taken a heavy toll of the invading forces in the Macassar Straits and had won the first battle in the Coral Sea. Time to expand a miniature professional army into a modern war machine. Time to take civilians gathered in a peacetime conscription while we were still debating. To mold them into soldiers. Train them in the use of new weapons, new tactics. Time to teach them the lesson Europe had learned too late. That modern war could only be won by men of skill. Time to send these men to our new bastions, Newfoundland. Trinidad, Bermuda, Greenland, Iceland. We were buying time to build an air force, the largest air force in the world for our army and navy. And we were buying time to weld the home front and the fighting front into one. For this was total war, and we realized victories were born in the production line. We needed more ships, more planes, more tanks, more guns, more shells. We were not fighting alone. 
Nine of the Pan-American neighbors severed diplomatic relations with the Axis. Colombia, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela. At this time, the issue is clearly drawn. There can be no peace until Hitlerism and its monstrous parasites are utterly obliterated. And until... Nine of the Pan-American nations declared war upon the aggressors. Cuba, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama. Mexico joined these nations in June 1942. We were not fighting alone. Even in the conquered countries, the will to fight survived. Dutch, Belgians, Yugoslavs, Greeks, Czechs, Filipinos, Poles, Norwegians, free Frenchmen, all fought with us on the far-flung battlefields. Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, Canadians. We were not fighting alone. In this war, the people seeking a world without war for their children. Britain, growing steadily stronger in its third year of war, sweeping the skies of conquered Europe, harassing the enemy with commando raids, sending forth huge armadas of bombers over German cities Hitler promised would never be attacked. Russia, fighting with an unparalleled tenacity, drawing upon inexhaustible reserves, asking no mercy and offering none. China, knowing the patience of an ancient civilization, surmounting handicaps that would have destroyed other nations, fighting on as it had fought alone. And the people of the United States, an angry people, whose resources and privileges were the envy of the world, offering these without stint, fighting in the factories and the foxholes, fighting in the jungle, the deserts, the frozen wastes, fighting on all the oceans, fighting for survival, fighting a war which would be hard and might be long, but which they would win.